Lazy and Lisa on FM, on DAB, or listen to your heart's content on iHeartRadio. It's the pick of the bunch, 96 FM. Coming up on the podcast today, Todd Sampson talks about his new documentary, Mirror Mirror. Jonathan Lapalia previews the Survivor finale and proof that ducks can talk. I have huge uh, respect for people who have the determination and the willpower. Thank you. To get up, <laughs> to get, you don't know what I'm going to say yet, <laughs> to get up at this time of the day oh, and yeah. go and exercise. Mm-hmm. Now, I have an excuse not to, but I, I can guarantee you, if, even if I didn't have to get up till 10 o'clock, I still wouldn't get up and <laughs> go <laughs> and exercise because I'm lazy. But there are quite a lot of 24-hour gyms around now, mm. and there's one that I drive past each morning. Uh, it's on Albany Highway. It's it's just past the Broken Hill Hotel. See, there's my identifying mm, yeah. uh, landmark, so yeah. that'll tell you volumes. Um, 4.30 in the morning, I drive past, and it's always busy. There's the, a huge queue, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. the, the the street outside the this gym mm. is chockers with cars. Yeah. It's amazing. So you people up to- <laughs> You people. <laughs> you people up doing the business at this time of day might be interested in this story. An Australian man- has smashed absolutely to smithereens the Guinness World Record for the longest-held plank. Daniel mm. Scarley managed to hold the core-busting position for nine hours, oh. 30 minutes oh. and one second. Now, doing one for more than a minute is hard enough, yeah. I've heard, let alone <laughs> managing to do it for hours on end oh. without a break. Nine hours, 30 minutes and one second. Daniel obliterated the previous record, which was set by ex-Marine George Hood in February last year, who held a plank for eight hours, 15 minutes and 15 seconds. Um, What makes this even more amazing is Daniel did it with something called CRPS, which is Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, which leaves his arm in constant pain at even the slightest bit of pressure. So this guy thought, well, I'll do a plank then. For nine hours, 30 no. minutes and one second. He developed CRPS after an accident when he was 12 and it causes the brain to send incorrect messages to the affected arm. Uh, Scarly tried to alleviate the pain by wearing a compression sleeve, but he admits he still experienced searing pain up and down his arm during the nine and a half hour and one second <laughs> plank. The one but second. That, <laughs> no, that, that one second. It's the how, most painful part of the whole thing. That would have been the longest thing. one second yeah. ever. But this is why he did it. Uh, Daniel wanted to raise awareness for CRPS to let everyone know there are plenty of people around the world who suffer with daily pain, just live with pain. Mm. Every day. He says if he can get through nine and a half hours and one second of searing pain, then he hopes that people think that they can get through anything. Good on you, Daniel. Yeah. That that's I mean it was it was amazing enough without mm. before I read that you did it with this yeah. searing pain up and down your arm. The most I've done it for is two minutes. Two and, minutes, and that, that's that, impressive. That hurt. Yeah. Yeah, you do yeah. the F forty five, don't you? Yeah. Right. We only do the plank every now and then, thank God. It's so what, what does F stand yeah. for? Forget about yeah. it? Or no, it's, it's another <laughs> or word. Or something else. Well, I use another word after two minutes. <laughs> you could do the lay down for hours oh, if you I like. Could. I do. Yeah. I'm so good at it. I, I, but whenever the Winter Olympics is on, I'm like in practice for the luge. <laughs> my couch <laughs> every day. <laughs> Todd Sampson is joining us this morning. Mirror Mirror begins at 7.30 tonight on Channel 10. It's a two-part documentary that covers body image and its negative effects. Todd goes on a mission to understand why we're so sat- dissatisfied with how we look and what, this is the big question, what we can do about it. Todd, good morning. Good morning. So, Todd, I grew up in the 80s. This is by no means and I'm I'm sure you wouldn't uh, dispute it, by no means a new thing. It hasn't come about in the latest generation or anything, but I suspect social media has made it the worst it's ever been. What is it about this subject that made you want to make a documentary about it? Well, it started with my youngest daughter, Jet, and one day I asked her just casually, almost as a joke, Mm. and I said, Jet, would you rather be beautiful or smart? And she hesitated. Mm. And I was shocked and got it. And I said, come on, Jet, really? Mm. And she said, Dada, most of my friends would say beautiful. And then I did some research. And, and most 20, of them in did. fact, mm. 25% of the kids would, would rather be beautiful than smart. And I thought there's a documentary in that. Yeah. Well, you know why they say they'd rather be beautiful or smart is I think because we live in this world that celebrates being beautiful yes. over being smart. Of course they're going to say it. Yeah. I, and here's the challenge. I wonder here's what I'd issue. say given the choice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a grown-up, you know. 
really? Think about the brain, right? Yeah. We know the brain is plastic. We know the brain is, is metaphorically pl- plastic, and it adapts to everything around it and what it sees. Mm. So when you are surrounded by idealized beauty images, by photoshopped, by filtered images, by perfect bodies, by influencers that only show the best of themselves, yeah. when you're surrounded by that, your brain adapts, and it rewires believing that that is the norm. God, and it's evolutionary. Oh. Yes, it's and and that's the scary part of it. And and there's a there's a scene in the film where I go down to film an OnlyFans shoot with a woman called Haley Vernon. Now I didn't know who Haley was. Oh, I know I'd who she is. I never watched Maps. Yep, yep. I had no idea. Yep. And so I end up down in Melbourne, and it goes completely sideways because what I didn't know is OnlyFans is the paywall for porn. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but here's the issue, right? So you go, oh, okay, porn's been around a long time. Here's yeah. the issue: the Average age of first exposure to pornography in this country, mm-hmm. eight to 10 year olds. Wow. And the majority of that by accident, because yeah. parents like me have given their kids iPhones as pacifiers and dummies from a young age, mm. and they just click and they find it by accident. Mm. This is the thing that's different about from when I was growing up. The, you know, porn when I was growing up was a bit of side boob on SBS <laughs> on a movie that, you know, you accidentally saw, but now uh, just drenched in it. Um, in terms of what can be done, <laughs> it is such a, a good luck with finding what can be done. But how did you, was in the second part of the documentary, you do look at this and would you say it is not something we can cut out, but something we might be able to manage? Well, uh, so we do cover it in the show. Lots of practical tips as to what parents and kids and adults can do in this sort of world we live in. Uh, the first thing, though, is a Luddite prohibition tends not to work. No, so never has. So pretending that it doesn't exist and telling our kids not to use it and then just going ahead and using it anyway away from us is not good. There are two things that were pointed out in the film that jumped out at me straight away as being relatively easy. The first one is... Uh, diversity of following. So we, to help our kids curate an environment to follow not just the beauty ideal, to follow intellectuals or to follow academics or to follow other people, writers or people that are doing interesting things. Mm. Because what we surround ourselves with neurologically determines who we are. It's that old saying of we are the combination of our five best friends. Yeah. Imagine that in social media. Well, it'd be and nice if we could fight it with what started it. Yeah, I mean, but the other thing which I thought was really useful is we know that at night our brains change, particularly for kids. They go from using their frontal cortex, which is a rational part of their brain, to their amygdala, which is emotional. Yeah. So this makes them super prone to bullying, online bullying and harassment. So we, we as, a, as parents, we ban our kids from social media or devices in their room at night. Mm. Mm. There is, it is such an important issue today, as we say, more than ever. I'd love to talk more to you, Todd, but we don't have time. It starts tonight at 7.30 on 10. It's a two-part documentary. I think it is important that everybody watch it as a family. Thank you, Todd. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. More of this podcast in just a sec. 96 FM. An Australian talking duck. Has this is a serious story? Has proved birds. I, I can, can tell. I can look on your face. You're serious. Can imitate speech. The first documented instance of ducks being able to mimic sounds has researchers reviewing the evolution of vocal language learning in birds. They have found Australian musk ducks can imitate sounds, including human speech. Now, this uh, duck in question that they've studied. His name is Ripper. He's a male musk duck reared in Ripper, reared in captivity at Tidbinbilla, which is a nature reserve southwest of Canberra. He has been able to vocalise the sound of a door slamming shut, and recently has started uttering (laughs) or quacking a certain phrase. Now I have a recording of Ripper. Have a listen to see if you can spot what he's saying. Again. He's saying, you bloody fool. No. How's his voice? (laughs) (laughs) You bloody fool, they reckon he's saying. (laughs) I just didn't expect a duck to have a voice like that. Researchers believe it was a phrase that Ripper likely heard repeatedly from his caretaker, but are unsure how old he was when first exposed to it. He was four years old at the time of the recordings and made his vocalisations during aggressive mating displays. That's not going to get you very far, Ripper, calling her a bloody fool. (laughs) 
It is the uh, the recording of Ripper appears to be the first comprehensively documented instance of the species being able to mimic sounds they hear joining other birds, including songbirds, parrots and hummingbirds. You know what's amazing about this story? They give people money for this research. <laughs> They give people I know. grants. There's other things that should be, you know. To record a duck doing this and saying he's saying you bloody fool. <laughs> I think we're all fools. We're buying it. The Shaw Report on 96 FM. It seems like maths 2022 might be a little different with, wait for it. Celebrities revealing they've been approached by producers to take part in the show. The Daily Mail says maths producers have also been hitting up single former participants to have another go. Is, is the pool not as full as it used to be? Uh, definitely. And uh, and there's another report that the infamously portrayed clingy firefighter from The Bachelorette, Jamie Doran, has also been approached by a casting agent. Now, word on the street is he got a text that read, I'm a casting producer for Married at First Sight. I am casting this year and I'm just wondering if you are still looking for love (laughs) and would be interested in applying. (laughs) Imagine imagine that being your day, having to write that text. His reply was, not a bleeping chance. Short, sweet and not surprising considering he's been battling for a year now over his depiction on The Bachelorette and also then on Batchy in Paradise. While casting seems to have kicked off, production will be postponed due to the pandemic and won't finish up until at least March next year. So in a text, they write bleeping, right? No, he he responded with not a, and I put the bleeping in to keep it above board. It's not actually what he said. Should have put the duck in there. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly. (laughs) (laughs) That's the talking duck that we talked about earlier. Yeah. That should have been in a, in a fine piece of camera yeah, research. I, I, think it, I think that's money well spent. <laughs> uh, now, Australian Survivor, it's uh, happening a big final on Sunday, 7.30 on 10. and It's Brains versus Brawn. Yes. And Jonathan LaPaglia, the host with the most, joins us now from Hotel Quarantine in Sydney. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. You're hanging in with the whole quarantine lockdown business? Uh, yes. I'm Got at no the, choice. I'm, it's my last day. Oh, yeah, so I'm. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm hopeful again. <laughs> it's Freedom Day! <laughs> Hooray! Well, uh, the final three contestants, our own Flick from WA, uh, George and Haley, will battle it out for the title of Soul Survivor. And a $500,000 cash prize. Can we just take a moment? That is half mm, a, a million. million dollars. It never ceases to amaze me the money that's on the line for this. It's so oh, much. It is, and also it, uh, it's tax free. You know, prize money yeah. also is, is tax free. So, you know, the US it's a million dollar prize, but you have to pay tax on it. So it's mm. pretty much the same as the you know as the US prize money, mm. Mm. which is pretty remarkable. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. What will yeah. Flick, Haley, and George have to do to get their hands on that lot of money? Well, first of all. They need to get through the last challenge, mm. and uh, which I don't know if you guys have seen the promo for that, but it's pretty gnarly. It's like a bed of nails oh, God. that they need to endure for hours and hours and hours. Oh. And uh, and um, the basically the winner of that challenge will decide who will go through with them to the final two and who will join the jury. Mm-hmm. And then once they get to the final two, then they need to make their pitch to the jury, and then the jury will vote. Who and they will decide who's the final winner of the show and the five hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, they've still got a bit to go. So yeah. they're going to really rely on <clears throat> how they've played the game through the that's entire That's all time. part of it, isn't yeah. it? That's part of surviving. Yeah, yeah. like there might have yeah, been some I mean, stuff that you've done at the start. It you've could forgotten. come back it to bite haunt you. In the, you. Yeah. yeah. Totally. That's kind of the genius of the game. The people that you're voting out then become the people that vote for you to win. So you mm. need to vote them out in such a way that you can retain their vote. Mm. It's really quite, you know, it's quite sophisticated. Yeah, it is. So what, is what challenge has been your favourite this season? Um, oh, look, we've had some great, like, just recently there have been some great challenges where, um, you know, those, those kind of horse race challenges where the lead changes all the time. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, you know, like there was one where Way came all the way from the back and then won on the on the puzzle. That was great. Mm. Uh, the last challenge that we just had where Flick came all the way from the back and then she won in the final end game. Mm. I like those kinds of challenges because they're exciting. They're visceral, you know? Yeah. Whose ingenuity has impressed you most this season? 
Uh, probably George. Yeah. You know, he's like he's really um, been quite clever strategically and and very bold in his moves. You know, and and that's what I love as a fan of the show. That's personally what I love. I love seeing big, bold moves. Yeah. And he's been so bombastic this year. You know, it's great. Mm. Well, do you think the argument of brains versus brawn has been settled? Mm, not quite. You're going to have to wait until Sunday. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's going to come down to the wire. All right. Coming down to the wire. We've still got, we got one brawn and two brains left, so right. we're going to find out. But you really have to use both to get mm. to the very end of this. So we will see on Sunday night, 7.30 on Channel 10. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, thank you, guys. Have fun Thanks with uh, the last day with quarantine. Liberation yeah. Day. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> More of this podcast in just a sec. Ninety six FM. There's a story on the front page of the paper today. I uh, still call West Australia home. It says a poll has found West Aussies identify more closely with the state than the country. A majority of West Australians identify most. That's what I just said. More strongly with their state than country. The finding was contained in a survey commissioned by the Centre for Independent Studies which revealed 54% of WA respondents identify first and foremost as West Australians rather than Australians. Now, it's important to note with these things, of course, that that's 54% of 1,029 people asked. It's not exactly a huge sample. No, no, considering how many people actually live in uh, yeah, WA itself. It's, it's a lot more, they say, than any of the other states showed up as to where they identify being yeah. their state or Australian. I'd have to say it's a question I've never even given any consideration no, to. No. I think of it's it's one and the same to me. I, yes, I'm West Australian, I identify mm. as an, uh, an Australian. It, it's just same, same. Yeah. I don't think of the two things as being two different things. But we want to ask you on 131065, you know, the old uh, thing that's happening at the moment, tell us you're from... Yeah. Something, something without telling us something, something. Well, we want you to tell us you're from West Australia without telling us you're from West Australia. For example, let's say there's a uh, blockage on the freeway mm-hmm. and there's a, an accident ahead. Yes. You're going to have to allow an extra bit of time for the looky-loos. That tells you from West, you're from West Australia, doesn't it? Yes. Like right, my example? Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Up with me back up. <laughs> I'm in trying. The, meantime. the brain is. That is a very West Australian right. thing. That's telling okay. you I'm from, I'm from West Australia without telling you I'm from West Australia. Right. You with me? Yes. Okay. Lisa in Bullsbrook, good morning. Good morning. Well, I'd like a Palladian. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hit us with it. I'd like a Palladian sauce sandwich for lunch, please. <laughs> oh, yum. Man, I loved Palladian sauce sandwiches. Yeah. They were the best. I haven't had one of those for years. Really? Because yeah. you Eastern State people Excuse say me. Devon. What's Devon? No, I've always it's known. It's a place in England. I've always known it as Have Poloni. you? Poloni? Yeah, because yeah, I never never ate it when I was over East. Loved a Poloni <laughs> sandwich. I loved that. And I loved um, last night's Rissoles with, um, in a sandwich with tomato oh, sauce as well. Yeah. Ketchup. Mm. I don't, I don't do Catch up on what? <laughs> Lisa, thank you. On what's you. going on here in West Australia. That totally says you're from West Australia without telling us you're from West Australia. Hi, Walter. Good morning. Hello. So when you're on the freeway in the right-hand lane and the driver in front of you is doing 80 kilometres an hour, <laughs> you're in West Australia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get out of my way. <laughs> it's so true. That's true. Yeah. Thank you, Walter. All good. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye. See ya. Deborah in Hammersley, tell us you're from West Australia without telling us you're from West Australia. Well, in summer, I like to open my windows to let the doctor in. Ah, ah yes. let the doctor in. That's a classic line. Yep, yep. The Fremantle doctor. Although the doctor's gone missing the last, I think, the last few years. Do you think? Yeah, I haven't really felt the doctor. Maybe I live. You're living too far away yeah, from the maybe, coast. maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. No worries. Bye. Talking about ways to tell us you're from West Australia without telling us you're from West Australia. Jackie in Bayswater, hello. Hi, how are you? Good. So it's a beautiful day. It is a beautiful day. It is. That's that's so, one way of telling us you're from yeah. West Australia. <laughs> 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 What's another? Um, well, I'm from West Australian because I'm, I would spend every school holidays at Rottnest Island. Yes. And it was my number one destination, mm. especially as a teenager. Mm. No, no adults, 
riding my bike around, oh. snorkeling, surfing, the quackers. Yeah, I just loved it. Absolutely did, loved it. Did you do the end of school trip to Rottnest? I certainly did. Me too. <laughs> yeah, 15, 16. Yeah. And had such a great time at Kent City. Yeah. Or Kent, <laughs> Kent Land or Kent City. Yeah. And just fantastic. I would also as a child stay at the barracks with my parents. Yeah. And that was, you know, the old jail. Yes. That was fantastic to stay in there yeah. as well. And um, just a wonderful time exploring the island. Mm. Before and we had to get on a queue, you know, in a queue, in a list mm. to get a, you know. I thought but those the were the days. Thanks, Jackie. I know, but that was, yeah, Garden Island was fantastic too. Mm. If it had island in Absolutely. the title, <laughs> we're, we're, there. we're there for it. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Jackie. Jackie. You're welcome. Have Bye. a good day. Including Island Cooler. Do you remember? <laughs> Remember Island Coolers? Yes, sort of. It was sort of that cheap summer wine oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Island yeah. Coolers, yeah. Mm. This survey on the front page of the paper this morning, 54% of Australia. That's a big number, isn't it's it? It's a big number. 1,002, 1,029, I should say, yeah. people were asked. So not a huge sample. And it was a lot smaller in, in the other states. It, yeah, of people identifying mm. with their state ahead of identifying with their yeah. country was the question. And we're asking you to tell us you're from West Australia without telling us you're from West Australia. Peter in North Beach, hello. Good morning, how are we doing? Good. Good. Excellent, excellent. I um, I went to bed with fat cut last night. <laughs> <laughs> Rightio. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Some old person was doing her other. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Peter. That absolutely says you're from West Australia yeah. without saying you're from West Australia. Nothing weird at all in Nothing that to at, us. No. No. Maybe to others, <laughs> but not to us. Renee and Bassendine, you have the final word. Tell us. Oh, just only a shorter five-hour drive down the road. <laughs> exactly. That is the ultimate yeah. telling us, yeah, it's only five hours. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. I've got relatives in New Zealand and they um, can't believe when you say, oh. yeah, we're, we're going up to Shelton. It's only a, a few hours drive, nothing yeah. major. Yes. You know, they're, what? I know. <laughs> five hours there on the other island, just yeah. about. It's amazing. <laughs> I think the funniest one is when somebody says, oh, it's a, you know, 40 minute drive down the freeway to the city. I'm like, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. It's yeah, you guys are used to two hours. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it is a big state. I always used to, when I lived in Melbourne for a while, I always used to laugh at people would say, oh, do you go to Broome for the weekend? Mm. No, do you go to Port <laughs> Douglas? It's like, you know, it doesn't quite work that no. way. <laughs> Renee, thank you so much for your call. You have a great day, guys. You, yeah, too. you too. Thank you, everyone, for your calls this morning. How to say you're from West Australia without telling us you're from West Australia. 96 FM, The Bunch, Clairzy and Lisa.